tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Heavy smoke conditions on all floors, uh, smoke showing through all windows of the building. Fire ravages a downtown Victoria building. One man is unaccounted for also. They believe that um, they may find a way to save a lot of lives. Contracted out by the BC Wildfire Service, victims of Saturday's plane crash near Smithers are remembered and... It's been the most amazing experience I could ever um, possibly imagine. It's a boy. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle welcome their first child. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. One man is missing after a massive fire tore through an empty hotel in downtown Victoria today. The four-story blaze sent smoke billowing into the air, seen as far away as Washington State. Flames started in the basement of the old Victoria Plaza Hotel sometime around 5.30 this morning. Crew spent several hours trying to put out the blaze, successfully stopping it from spreading to nearby businesses. Buildings along Government Street between Pandora and Johnson were evacuated, including City Hall. Nearby roads are still closed tonight. Despite warnings to stay away, crowds lingered behind emergency barriers to watch crews in action. It's kind of a sight to see downtown here, such a, like so close to everything, such big flames and all the force from the Victoria Fire Department. It's, uh, it's pretty crazy to see it all. A, a fire of this scope uh, is going to continue to burn for a long period of time. So right now, again, we're just putting out hot spots and making sure that the fire doesn't spread to any other adjacent properties. Victoria police say the building's caretaker is unaccounted for, though they have no information to indicate he was actually inside when the fire broke out. Crews have yet to perform a structural assessment on the building, but one wall has collapsed and more could still come down. The Plaza Hotel has been closed since 2013. The site recently eyed for redevelopment. On Wednesday, Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou is scheduled to appear in B.C. Supreme Court for extradition proceedings. It's the latest chapter in a case that sparked a trade war between China and Canada. Lost in the spat, as Tina Lovegreen reports, some Chinese Canadians who feel their voices have not been adequately heard. Protests and interest grew quickly when news broke of Meng Wanzhou's arrest in December. Some demanding she be freed. We think she should have released right away. I think the feeling there was uh, Meng was being uh, played as a political puppet. While that's the perspective that made headlines, it wasn't a view shared by everyone. Speak to one Chinese person, you get the view of everyone. That's far from it. Meng was arrested in Vancouver on a warrant seeking her extradition to the United States for allegedly helping Huawei violate sanctions in Iran. She was released on a $10 million bail. The case brought such global interest, her house on the city's west side turned into a kind of tourist attraction. It became a conversation like, well, you know, what is it? What's, what's behind all this? I think a lot of people didn't know the facts. So what do Chinese Canadians really think about the case? Results of an online survey revealed a very different story. The majority of Canadian Chinese are in support of the decision taken by the Canadian government. Of the more than 400 Chinese Canadians surveyed, 54% supported Canada's decision to uphold the rule of law. That said, fewer were in favor of Hmong actually being extradited if that's what the court ruled. Pattern holds up regardless of period of immigration, mother tongue, and the language they consume the media in. Ivy Lee and her friends fall in the group that supports the actions of the Canadian government. They definitely want to see a fair and transparent extradition process. But the poll found younger Chinese Canadians and newer immigrants didn't know much about the case or understood how Canada's justice system works. We need to think of ways to find those two, find those two groups of people and provide more education. Regardless of public opinion, Meng's fate will continue to have repercussions beyond the courtroom. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Richmond. A former B.C. mayor has pleaded guilty to four sex offenses against underage kids in Burns Lake. 28-year-old Luke Strimbold is facing a total of 29 charges. 
There are seven alleged victims. All of them were under the age of 16 when the offenses happened. Today, he pleaded guilty to two counts of sexual assault and one count each of sexual interference and invitation to sexual touching. Strimbold was just 21 when he was elected mayor of Burns Lake back in 2011. He was the youngest mayor in B.C. and the second youngest in Canada. The statue of a B.C. judge involved in hanging First Nation chiefs more than 100 years ago could be removed from its spot in New Westminster. City councillors are voting on whether to take down the figure of Judge Matthew Begbie, which stands outside the law courts off Carnarvon Street. The motion says in 1864, the Begbie presided over the trial that resulted in the wrongful hangings of six chiefs. Some councillors say the removal of his statue is an important step toward reconciliation with First Nations. A dire situation. The United Nations says nature is in more trouble now than at any other time in human history. It says one million plant and animal species are at risk of disappearing forever. But as Kasparusi explains tonight, there is a glimmer of hope. Ahead of a United Nations report, demonstrators from the World Wildlife Fund staged a protest in Paris on the weekend, dressed in bumblebee costumes, a species that is under threat. The report itself says nature is in decline globally at rates unprecedented in our history, with one million species threatened with extinction all because of human activities. There are a lot of species, individual species and habitats that are, that are suffering so significantly that they'll go to extinction. Extinction is permanent, right? He says in some cases, the damage done could be irreversible. In terms of collectively, societally, that's too hard to say, you know? It seems, like, it seems quite clear that we're not there yet, that we still do have time, but we don't have time to dither around. The report offers a dire picture of nature in dramatic decline. Every corner of the planet, from insects, animals and plants, to mammals in the ocean. It's not just an environmental issue. It is an economic issue, a development issue, a security issue, uh, a social, moral and ethical issue. Some of the more threatened species include amphibians, mammals, marine mammals. Fish are exploited too, with more than one third of fish stocks over harvested. But the report does offer hope. Nature reserves and wilderness areas have helped protect land and oceans. Its authors believing it's not too late to make a difference. Cass Rusi, CBC News, Toronto. Meanwhile, in our country, organizations and prominent Canadians are banding together to push for a government plan to prevent climate change. It's called the Pact for a Green New Deal. Organizers want a plan that cuts Canada's emissions in half by 2030 while ensuring no one is left behind economically. 67 organizations have signed on to support the pact, including the Union of BC Indian Chiefs and the Canadian Union of Postal Workers, as well as dozens of Canadian celebrities like Neil Young and Kobe Smulders. This press conference is called because I, th I believe we're at a critical moment, a catastrophic crisis that is an enormous opportunity to change direction towards a genuinely sustainable future. The Green New Deal is that opportunity. The group says its focus is on uniting diverse groups behind a single goal and pushing political leaders to act. The Pact for a Green New Deal is also launching this week in Montreal and Toronto. We're learning more tonight about that deadly plane crash near Smithers over the weekend. The victims were contracted out by the BC Wildfire Service, surveying last year's damage. And as the CBC's Joel Ballard reports, family members of those who died are searching for answers. Full of energy, extremely talented, great sense of humor. Days after 26-year-old Amir Sedgi's plane crashed, his family's trying to come to terms with the loss. There are moments that it hits us really bad. There are, we can't really, we can't really understand. Sedgi is one of three people who died in the accident near Smithers in northwestern BC. The pilot, the only survivor, still in hospital. The crew was contracted out by BC Wildfire Services, doing infrared scans of last year's damage. They'd been collecting these images since last summer. 
At a meeting on Friday, the BC Wildfire Service asked them to take one more flight to gather some additional images. It was during this flight that their plane went down. Vancouver's Lauren Gorbel is one of the other victims, a neighbor of Amar Sedgi for many years. It was Gorbel who first gave Amir a job with the company two years ago. They believe that uh, they may find a way to save a lot of lives because in the past few years, BC has had a lot of wildfire issues and a lot of people have lost their homes and lives for it. And they, uh, they were hoping that they could find a way to, um, to reduce and help the environment and help the, the, the province with this huge issue that we're having and we con continue having. Gorbel's wife has posted a tribute in his honor. She says, his death is unreal. It has broken our hearts and our spirits, and we are in gathering mode to simply survive. In a statement, Minister of Forests, Lands, Natural Resources, Doug Donaldson, says, our thoughts are with the family and friends of everyone involved in this incident. I would like to extend our deepest sympathies to the families. How and why the plane went down is still under investigation. As for Amir's family, they're holding on to his memory. The only thing that's been helping us survive at this moment, just to remember that he was cool as cucumber. He, he knew in the most intense situations how to crack a joke and make everyone just calm down. He, <laughs> he, knew, how to, he knew how to love everyone. Joel Ballard, CBC News, North Vancouver. Well, for the third time in just six months, people living in Nanaimo are heading to the polls. This time to pick their member of parliament. Our Tanya Fletcher is at the NDP campaign headquarters in Nanaimo. Tanya, are there concerns about voter fatigue this time around? There are, Anita, and that's because essentially these voters are going to the polls for the fourth time in what will be one calendar year. It was all triggered by the municipal f uh, election in the fall. That triggered the provincial by-election in January when we were here, and that in turn triggered this federal by-election. And keep in mind, it's all ahead of the federal general by-election that's coming up in October. So I asked voters here today whether they're getting a sense of voter fatigue and, in effect, voter apathy. Here was how they answered. It seems like we, we're voting all the time now. There's a lot going on, and if they're not you know, out there and talking about it all the time, then people can definitely get confused about what's going on with things. Probably voter fatigue. I can I, see that. Most people would think that I way. But it's I really, there's nothing it. more you can do. Like, there's nothing you can do about it. So do you think it maybe adds to voter apathy? Oh, I Certainly. I agree totally with that. We'll know tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> And we will know tomorrow indeed. Now, there were some on the flip side, though, who say that it's having the, in fact, opposite effect because with so many um, uh, campaigns and people talking about politics and elections over and over, it actually keeps voters more engaged year-round rather than just simply uh, finding out what they need to know the morning of heading to the polls. Yeah, a lot of trips to the ballot box uh, for certain, Tanya. But as you say, with the federal election looming in the fall, what's at stake there in Nanaimo? Yeah, a lot of at stake uh, here heading into the fall election, and this is considered perhaps an indicator, these voters, a bit of a litmus test to see how the public is feeling ahead of the October general vote. Now, let's take you through some of the candidates in this uh, federal by-election for the NDP. We have Bob Chamberlain. He's a former vice president of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, and we're at NDP headquarters here right now. He's been milling about uh, with some of the volunteers. For the Conservatives, John Hurst is the uh, candidate. He's a financial manager, and at the age of 32, the youngest uh, person on the slate. Uh, Michelle Corfield is running for the Liberals. She's a First Nations leader who served as chair of the Nanaimo Port Authority. And for the Green Party, Paul Manley is running. He's a communications specialist. It might be a familiar name as well as he ran for the party in the last time around in 2015. And talking more about what's at stake here, this is an NDP riding to lose. This has been a strong NDP stronghold. Uh, but looking at the way the riding boundaries changed in 2012, it basically pulled in pockets of deep conservative uh, traditions as well as deep conser uh, NDP roots. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out today in those, uh, you know, battling, uh, opposing uh, um, views on the spectrum as well as the Green Party. They're once again the X factor. And if they're able to pull more of uh, the votes from the left and split the vote on that side, that would be good news for the Conservatives because there again, there is some strong support from the Conservatives as well. And the Liberals too. It'll be interesting to see how the SNC-Lavalin affair has affected Justin Trudeau and his party and how that will carry through all the way to the fall uh, vote in October. Anita, Mike?
All right, polls close at 8.30. Thanks, Tanya. Live in Nanaimo tonight. <laughs> Officials in Russia say there's no reason to ground its fleet of Sukhoi passenger jets after a horrific crash yesterday at the Moscow airport. 41 of 78 people on board were killed when the Aeroflot plane made an emergency landing while enveloped in a huge fireball. As Chris Brown explains, today officials began combing through the aircraft to try to figure out what happened. Investigators have now found the two flight recorders from the remains of the burnt out aircraft, the flight data recorder, and also the voice recorder as well. The aircraft still right in the middle of operations at Sheremetyevo. It's been delaying flights there all day and looks like it's uh, not going to be moved uh, very quickly. The death toll stands at 41 people killed, including at least two children. What we know, eight minutes into the flight, the pilots uh, declared that there was a problem with the electronics on board. They'd lost radio contact. 14 minutes later, they declared a full-blown emergency. Their plane circled. It appears the uh, city of Moscow at least once and then came in for a very hard, very uh, fast landing. We could see the tail of the aircraft strike the ground as it bounced into the air, and that sent really the whole plane into an inferno uh, hurtling down the, uh, the runway. From inside, just horrific video where you can hear people screaming, mothers shouting for their children to come with them, other passengers trying to act uh, calm as those chutes at the front of the aircraft were deployed, and at least some of the passengers, just under half of the aircraft, managed to escape. Many things to consider here. It appears as though it may have taken several minutes for the bulk of the uh, rescue uh, crews, the fire trucks, to arrive on the scene. So a lot of people here asking questions why, especially when the pilot had declared an emergency that happened and then there's the pilot's claim that this was caused by uh, a lightning strike one of the passengers on board also said this but you're also seeing a lot of skepticism being expressed on russian social media really because airplanes are designed to deal with lightning strikes uh, and some are suggesting that maybe this is a way for the company perhaps the airliner and the plane manufacturer to avoid blame by saying it was an act of god chris brown cbc news moscow well, 20 years ago today, refugees from war-ravaged Kosovo started arriving in B.C. More than 13,000 people were killed or went missing in the bloody two-year conflict that started in 1998. Thousands of ethnic Albanians ended up fleeing the country, and I caught up with a Kosovo refugee who arrived in Richmond along with 13 family members. You're starving. When his family fled war-torn Kosovo, Miftar Shala was a teenager. Now, a married father of two living in South Surrey. Life here is good, he says, but not a day goes by that he doesn't think about the horrors from two decades ago. I still, you know, uh, have fresh memories of uh, the dead people I've seen, burnt houses torn down, bombings, bullets flying everywhere. More than 13,000 people were killed or went missing. Miftar was on the run with his family, escaping Kosovo through the mountains. Hungry, wet, scared, it was horrific. Along with hundreds of other ethnic Albanian refugees, they ended up at a camp in Macedonia. Six weeks later, the Shalas were on a plane to CFB Trenton, Ontario, coming to Canada under an accelerated program to admit Kosovars with family here. Today, Miftar Shala admits Canada wasn't his family's first choice. Canada uh, was our last uh, option. We never dreamed, we never thought we, you know, that we would end up here. They ended up with relatives in Richmond, where CBC News first met them. The Shala family. Watching the story now with his daughter, Arissa, Miftar sees a shaken 17-year-old trying to cope with the loss of his country and the culture shock of a new one. You're in a different place. You still, you know, have these memories of, of what happened back home. Watching Seinfeld on TV helped him learn English. He graduated from high school and now runs a delivery company. Canada gave me a, a second chance in life, a good life. You know, I, I go to bed and I don't have to worry about, you know, anyone coming to uh, kill me or, you know, my family is safe here. And as for Canada being his family's last choice as a country to start a new life? 
I can say with you know all my heart, this is this is home for us, for my family. Mike Killeen, CBC News, Surrey. So I walk into work today and I see Brett left his weather screen up. And I saw a nice little 22 at the end of the week. Right? Yeah, I'm I very did that excited. just for you. I'm so glad that you found it. Um, yeah, that's my gift to you and to everyone else this week. We could actually be dealing with record-breaking heat by the time that Friday rolls around. Now, I don't want to jinx it. It's really too close to call just yet. But the theme for this week by far is going to be these warming temperatures and still a good amount of sunshine. And if not that, at least no rain. So, awesome. not really going to complain, right? No, yeah. not at all. All right, well, let's take a quick look then at how we started off our week in Vancouver today. So we did get one of those classic sunrises that we do enjoy so much if you were up and about first thing in the morning. Did have a few clouds to worry about first thing, but then as the day went on, it ended up becoming quite nice. And honestly, this is going to be the trend for the upcoming week. It's nothing really too exciting here. I don't have any crazy news to say in terms of rainfall, so I'm going to start with the temperature story and walk you through that as we go on. So right now, sitting outside our studios and across much of southern Vancouver Island, we've got temperatures right where they should be. So a 15 degrees down in the harbour, 16 at the airport. But as you can see, going into the Fraser Valley, we get temperatures already into the 20s, and that heat is just going to be climbing as the week goes on. Overnight lows, we're getting into that time of year where overnight lows should not really be dipping into the single digits for us in downtown Vancouver, though there's still the chance over toward New West and Surrey. And daytime highs for tomorrow across the region, you're going to start to see a trend here. 18 degrees, 19 degrees, and then 20s as you head east. This is going to be the entire week. I hope you don't get bored with my forecast. This, this is largely going to stay the same. Any rain that we do see is going to be on the southeastern portion of our province. Really nothing to worry about down here. And this is all because of a very nice ridge of high pressure that's going to be building over the region. I'm going to show you that right here. This is that high that I was talking about. It's preventing all of this rain that you're seeing going up toward the Gulf of Alaska from making its way on shore. So this just means relatively rain-free skies for us for the next little while. It will have one impact, though, just briefly to mention for you, if you are going to be taking the ferry tomorrow between Nanaimo and Vancouver, or at least Horseshoe Bay and Departure Bay, the winds here could potentially get up to 30 to 40 kilometers an hour. Our fire danger rating is quite high, but in general, we're looking at temperatures here going very nicely into that 22, maybe even a 23 if we're so lucky. I don't want to be that bold just yet, but the trend <laughs> is certainly there for this warmth to be continuing. Unreal. Love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Springtime, summertime, you don't really know what it is. It's kind of this nice transition. Well, whatever you call it, we'll take yeah, it. We'll yeah. take it. Exactly. Thanks, Brett. <laughs> no problem. Okay, uh, today marks a very special anniversary for Science World. 30 years for the mm -hmm. iconic Vancouver institution. Our reporter, Marie Seidler, got special access to the building for this behind-the-scenes look. Science World. It's a place pretty much every Vancouverite is familiar with. It's that weird round building in False Creek where you and your kids can go to learn about science. But the building has changed in the past 30 years, a lot. And that means some of its original parts have been left behind in bits and pieces, like this door that leads to nowhere. As you can see, when you come through here, uh, you basically just plummet onto the ramp that leads up to the Omnimax Theatre. Giant triangle around. Each of those is one of the silver triangles you see when you look at the outside of Science World. Brian Anderson has worked at Science World for 20 years. We are in one of the back hallways of Science World, and I always love to pass this. This is the old exterior of the building. When this was the Expo Center and Expo 86, uh, that's as far out as the building came. Science World was built in 1985. Expo 86 was just around the corner. It first served as the Expo Preview Centre and then as the Expo Centre when the fair opened. When Expo ended, the building underwent a massive $19 million renovation. Since it opened 30 years ago, Science World has become the center point for science education in BC, attracting 18 million people since it opened in 1989. This was a phenomenal addition to the culture of the city and very quickly it gained a reputation as an amazing place to bring kids to have hands-on learning experiences. Science World has shown hundreds of exhibits, including controversial bestsellers like Body Worlds. This little panel here. Behind the scenes, there are plenty of little treasures. This is the projection room for the Omnimax Theatre. So these big film discs you see there, that's one 45-minute Omnimax film. It's about four kilometers long. If you were to unreel it, it would go from Science World all the way to Granville Island. 
Most of the technology in this room hasn't changed in 30 years, but it will be updated as part of the building's always ongoing renovations. Renovations that will take Science World into the next 30 years. Marie Seidler, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, Brett, Mike, it's the moment yes. you've all been waiting for. Mm -hmm. It's a boy, a royal baby boy. Born this morning to Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. Mother and child both doing well, and as our Renee Filippone reports, the new dad, well, is beyond proud. From the arrival of a baby boy! Yeah! Windsor's town crier delivered the happy news to a joyous crowd today. Baby boy Sussex, seven pounds, three ounces, born early this morning. Hey, what a fantastic day. Have you seen the smiles on everybody's faces? It's wonderful news. Yes, it's a complete shock. We're all feeling quite euphoric and we're all getting a bit drunk here. <laughs> Anne Daly drove down from Wales to celebrate, hoping to see the royal couple. But I think a lot of people have been very disappointed because we, we, we're all here for the wedding and uh, we thought perhaps she might come out. But while the couple had never planned to make a public appearance, Harry did make a surprise statement for the media. The proud father, who was by Meghan's side for the birth, clearly thrilled. This little thing is, is, is absolutely to die for, so I'm just over the moon. The media stationed in Windsor had been watching and waiting for so long, some started to wonder if the baby was already born and the family was hiding out. But no, Meghan was just overdue. The royal couple wanted the birth to be a private affair. Unlike William and Kate, there would be no photo op on the steps of the hospital. This couple didn't even say where Meghan gave birth, opting instead to share the happy news on Instagram, even before the traditional announcement made outside Buckingham Palace. This baby is seventh in line to the throne, very unlikely to ever be even a working member of the royal family, let alone a king. So. He can be afforded a lot more privacy and a bit more freedom to grow up away from the spotlight. The couple hasn't announced a name yet. Some of the leading contenders are Alexander, Albert and James. The new parents have promised to let the world get a glimpse of the new royal in a couple days. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Windsor, England. I say just come out on the steps and show us the baby. Mm -hmm. So say you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, lots of excitement overseas, not so much here. Yeah, but uh, do people here in BC care about the buzz over the new baby? Well, we hit the streets of Vancouver to find out. People are, are attracted to the, the young royals because they're really more down to earth. They seem to be, people relate to them a lot easier. I think that they are perfectly fine people. I don't think they're really relevant in terms of how normal humans live their lives. I don't think they're very relevant anymore. I saw him on, I think it was on CBC, saying he was over the moon. <laughs> Good for him. Yes, it's fabulous news. Any baby coming is lovely, isn't it? And uh, we wish them well, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I'm really delighted the fact that they've got a little boy and I'm sure that they have, um, Harry have some fantastic time teaching them all the boy tricks, playing football, cricket and all the things that he really loves in rugby. So yeah, I'm really pleased. And it's just down the road from where I come from, so I'm really happy. And we found all the English people in yeah, Vancouver today. Was, was that done in London or was it done here? <laughs> yeah. Wow. There you go. Next thing will be the name, then we'll get the photos. And of course. It'll all happen. Maybe not on your timeline, <laughs> but, it, but it'll happen. It's good marketing. Roll it out slowly, there keep them busy go. and attracted mm. to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, that's it for us on uh, Facebook uh, for now. Television at 11 o'clock tonight uh, with Mr. Dan Burt. He'll have the results of the Nanaimo by-election. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's mm -hmm. it. Good night. Have a good one.